Knox Presbyterian Church, good morning. The last uh, 20 months or so has felt like we've needed to be like, okay, it is the time that we start, and because people are tuning on, we need to get going so that people aren't experiencing dead air or whatever you call that. Um, today is a different day in that we are maybe a little bit more sleepy than we usually are when we get here, and so we're going to have a little bit more grace for people as people are filtering in. Uh, welcome to worship. It is good to be with you. I want to just remind folks also that following worship, we have our ministry team meetings that will be uh, in the fellowship hall. If you're a part of a ministry team, or if you are just curious about what the heck that means, it'd be nice to have you join us. There's going to be some, um, some sustenance, some coffee, things like that. Uh, I also wanted to just call attention to the fact that we in our church are still looking for a more formalized worship leader, worship director. We're actively seeking that person out, whoever they may be. Um, and so I invite you to be praying with us about that as we continue to explore who that's going to be. I want to thank Camille and Lois for the wonderful job that you've been doing as you've been stepping in to help lead the music and everybody else who's been filling in. Um, today, if this is not enough reason or incentive for you to pray, you have to suffer through Richard and me. Um, so this is hopefully going to get our heads bowed uh, here pretty soon. You can assume whatever posture for worship uh, makes sense for you. Um, but if it feels good and right and worshipful and authentic for you to stand right now, and if you're able to do so, I invite you to do that now.
That hand is for Richard. Thank you very much, my friend. Let's continue our time of worship. We're in the same household. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, CJ or Junie, CJ, Junie, uh, it feels good to be able to do this together. We've never done this before. Great. We're going to read a little bit for you, and then CJ is going to offer you some words of encouragement as we light these candles representing this third Sunday of Advent. It's getting real, folks. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, who has done marvelous things. God's right hand and holy arm have gained the victory. 
The Lord has made known salvation, revealing righteousness in the sight of the nations. God has remembered mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, who is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness, God shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. The Lord is coming to make right the earth. Trade in your song for God's song, lost traded for victory. God has done marvelous things and is coming to restore the world. Sing a new song. Your original voice has been restored, transformed, made whole. What has always been is here again. Your song of victory is now made fresh. God is coming to make right the earth. This promise disrupts all things. The seas will roar, the rivers clap, and the hills get up and dance to the music we set ablaze. What can suppress this joy? Everything, all of creation to the ends of the earth, has seen the salvation of God. God remains faithful always. From the moment of speaking light into existence, God has been revealing righteousness. God is coming to make right the earth. All that seeks to withhold our joy has been overthrown. God has gained the victory in taking on flesh, has proved victorious. The God, the Holy Spirit, is with us. Be filled with God's joy and shout. Break forth in song. God is coming. Please pray with me. In this season of expectation, we prepare to welcome you, Christ Jesus, Messiah, into the bustle of our lives and the hard to find moments of solitude. We prepare to welcome you, Christ Jesus, Messiah, into our homes and situations along with friends and families. We prepare to welcome you, Christ Jesus, Messiah, into our hearts and those often hidden parts of our lives. We prepare to welcome you, Christ Jesus, Messiah, for beneath the surface of the Christmas story is an inescapable fact that you entered this world as vulnerable as any one of us in order to nail that vulnerability to the cross. Our fears, our insecurities, and our sins, all that can separate us from God, exchanged by your grace for love. We cannot comprehend the reasoning, only marvel that salvation comes to us through a baby born in a stable and reaches out to a world in need in this season of anticipation. We prepare to welcome you Christ Jesus, Messiah. 
To you, O oh Lord, we bring our lives, troubled, broken, or at ease, a sacrificial offering for you to use. Take away our selfishness and teach us to love as you loved. Take away our sense of pride and show us the meaning of humility. Take away our blindness and show us the world through your eyes. Take away our greed and teach us how to give as you gave. Show us your ways, teach us your paths that we might walk with you more closely. Our hand in your hand, our feet in your footsteps, from the baby in a stable to eternity. Amen. Following the doxology, you're invited to um, come forward or back <laughs> and um, bring an offering if, if you have one to bring, but more than that, to light a candle um, as a prayer, as a praise, um, as an acknowledgement of the light of Christ born into this world. And now stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings
Thank you, Lois and Nick. Our Old Testament scripture reading is um, Genesis 41, 25 to 36. And this follows um, uh, Pharaoh having a couple of dreams and being disturbed by them, asking Joseph to interpret the dreams. And Joseph responds and says to Pharaoh, um, I cannot do that, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And so this is what um, Joseph's uh, reply was regarding the dreams. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh that he is about what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of the abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt, so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. I believe that almost all of you know her, but coming up right now is Esther Stalker, who is a speech communications major in her final year at Whitworth University. Uh, Esther has been a faithful attendee of this church since you were a freshman, sophomore? Sophomore. Uh, longer than me. Uh, Esther, we are always blessed when we get to hear the word of God proclaimed through you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Drew. Um, I always love being here. Um, ever since I first started coming, um, it's been a home. And so when I was given the opportunity to speak um, an Advent on joy, I was more than enthused. Um, I didn't realize until later, though, how bad the timing was going to be, because it's my senior year, and next week is finals week. And I'm doing grad school prep, and I'm working. So while I was preparing for this, I had to really think about where I was finding sources of, of joy. And I began to realize I had agreed to this months ago. Uh, and I was excited, and I was looking forward to it. And I was saying to myself, as the time approaches, God will put on my heart what he wants me to say. And then I was like, I should probably look at the lectionary. I should probably do that. And another month had gone by, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. And then I got closer and closer, and I said, Drew, I don't, I need to talk with you. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And we had a conversation, and I was like, I still don't know what I'm going to talk about. And then it was last week when he was talking about peace, and he made the connection in the, in the lectionary about the context of the time and how far-reaching the intent behind the words are. And I... It's God revealed something in that moment of how joy within the scriptures is revealed through John the Baptist and what he expresses about joy in the context that he's explaining 
And I realized that in the months that I'd been preparing to talk about joy, I had been missing the point in the direction that I should be looking for joy. And so when I was reading this lectionary, it hit me like a wall that I was, I was the exact person that John was trying to talk about. And so while we unpack the joy that John is trying to explain, I challenge you to also see how you might also fall into that category. So this is our New Testament reading. It's Luke 3, 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to baptize baptize by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. Soldiers also asked him, and what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, all were asking questions in their hearts concerning John. All were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary, but the shaft will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Looking at John, uh, whenever I've heard people talk about the scripture before or unpacked what he means by you brood of vipers, it has always been in the context of challenging people to repent, guilting people into feeling like their behavior needs to change. But as we apply a different context and understanding of what he's trying to do, he isn't saying feel bad and change. What he's saying is you are finding joy in these places, in these things, and you should find joy in a new framework of living. So for the first group, where they're finding joy is the gathering as a whole. They're the ones that would say, we are the children of Abraham. They find joy in their own personal identity and their self-righteousness and the communities that they're a part of. We have seen this in the parables that Jesus talks as a little bit of a problem of how it can negatively impact others. Looking at this parable of the Good Samaritan, a Jewish leader and a Levite walk by a man who is beaten and dying in a ditch. And because they say, that is a Samaritan, that is not one of our people, I don't need to care about them, they walk by. And a Samaritan, who in that time, all of the audience would have seen as a bad person, as the other, he stops and he gives everything he can to the Samaritan in order to help him along. He gives him, he bandages his wounds, he takes him to an inn and he pays for his recovery. The Good Samaritan is an example of what good, generous humanity looks like. And what John is saying is that you are othering people. You are devaluing others, and that needs to change. So instead of finding self-righteousness and value and joy with who you are and who your group is, change. Value all humanity. Find joy from the shared humanity with others. Then the second group, it's just a group He doesn't give any other details, but they ask about possessions. What should we do? And John says, if you have two coats, give to one who has none, and same with the food. That is a little bit trickier for us to fully unpack and understand in our world where fast fashion makes it easy for us to have five coats, to have multiple clothes, to have everything that we can possibly need. What John is talking about, though, is finding joy through possessions and security. Having multiple things makes you feel comfortable and appreciative of what you have, but means that you are 
holding on to resources and to make, in order to make yourself feel better. And when John says, give to those that have none, he's expressing the desire for joy to be expressed through generosity. There are so many stories um, of children's books, of learning how to share, of being kind to others, of being generous. Um, but for some reason, the one that I kept coming back to was the story of, I believe it was Miss Pickles and her pickles. This was one of the weird children's books that my family um, always read that I've never seen anybody else even hear about. It's a very strange story of this woman who absolutely loved pickles. She had a pickle dress, a pickle house, dog that was dressed up as a pickle, a pickle car. Everything in her house was green. She only ate pickled food. And her niece got to the point of saying, this is, this is not good. You need to try other things. And so while they were out and about, the, the young girl, the niece of the woman, said, try this ice cream. Try this new thing, this new experience, and see how it can change you. See what you think. And so this woman, who had been very closed with her possessions, very limited, would hold on to anything that she could, tried the ice cream, tried a new flavor, a new experience, and it changed her life. She realized that she actually enjoyed other ways of living. And I realize that that's the same way that John is talking about here. Don't limit yourself to the resources that you find security in. Know that there are other ways for you to find happiness and joy out there, besides just pickles. As we move forward, the joy that John expresses at this point has just been a joy of settling, a joy in who you are, a joy in what you have found and been content with. After this, the joy that John pushes people against isn't a joy of, of changing your behavior. It's a limiting of your behavior. Because the next group is the tax collectors. And throughout the entire Bible, it's always been assumed that the tax collectors are the bad guys. The tax collectors cheat and steal and are disliked by everybody. And yet, still, they ask, what should we do? As if not cheating people out of money isn't apparent to them, which is kind of surprising. And what John says is limit your behavior. Don't take more money than you need to. Don't cheat others. Don't find joy from the money and satisfaction that you can bring from that. And there are so many movies that talk about the, the dangers of wealth, the dangers of getting more and more and trying to accumulate more and more money. My favorite movie to discuss this, though, is um, Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks, yeah. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he plays a con artist who steals thousands of dollars. And this is before there's like a set federal agency that is like seeks out fraud. Um, it's right at the beginning of that where Tom Hanks is trying to catch this con artist who pretends to be a pilot and flies a plane without having any idea what he's doing or pretends to be a doctor. Um, and is thrown into emergency situations with literally no medical experience. And the goal of Leonardo DiCaprio's character is to get money, is to get security. And what he does when doing this is that he hurts others. He steals thousands upon thousands of dollars and ruins many lives through the money that he steals. And Tom Hanks' character is he tries to catch him, he tries to stop him. And by the end of the movie, movie Tom Hanks does stop him Leonardo DiCaprio does stop being a con man, and he realizes that stealing all that money wasn't enough for him. It wasn't the money that he was searching for. It was the security, stability, and understanding of what his purpose in life was supposed to be. So at the end, Tom Hanks realizes the potential that is in the, in the con artist and pulls him into the Federal Bureau and seeks to use him to help him stop other crimes. And that becomes the con artist's new goal, to help others, to stop others being cheated. He limits his behavior in order to help others and to stop doing harms to others. The tax collectors never fully learn this, except as individuals. It is a culturally understood thing that the tax collectors take more money than they should. And John reprimands all of them for doing this. He says you need to limit your behavior so that others around you aren't being harmed. And the last group that he talks about is the soldiers. And during this time, soldiers were something to be feared. They were something that could cause, cause great harm, could steal from you, could cause physical damage, could ruin your lives if you do something bad. 
And when John talks to them, he says, do not exert more power than you need to. Do not find joy from the authority that you exude onto others. We have seen this in history go very, very poorly, of large groups of people seeking joy from how they can exert power over others. The largest one that I can think of is colonialization of Britain, um, France, Portugal, Spain, going out onto different continents and seizing power and control in order to feel more secure in what they have. They would take over large swaths of land um, in order to best the other countries. And what this did is it destroyed cultures, it destroyed large generations of people, um, and it harmed, it's harming countries still from the actions that they did, but they were finding satisfaction and joy from the power they were able to express and exude onto others. And what John says in this is do not do that. Don't exert power and authority in a way that brings you joy and passion in the world. Limit yourself, and instead of seeking power, seek contentment, generosity, and kindness. Move forward in the world in a way that you are able to share the world with others. And it's not your dominance over others that brings you comfort but is your unity with them, your equality with them, and your ability to say that I'm here to protect you and not to hurt you. It can be really easy when we look at this passage to look at individuals within the story, of look at the individual tax collectors that we know do bad things, that look at the individual people that have more possessions than we do. But this story isn't told in an individualistic culture like ours is, and that's one of the difficulties of the lens that we often look at this, that we say that others need to change, others need to fix. But when John is looking at this, John the Baptist is talking to the group, it's a collective. It's large groups of people that he is speaking to of seeing group and societal transitions. When we look at that for ourselves, it can be difficult to understand, well, how can we have a group transition if the individuals don't change? How can we as a collective be better and be more generous, kind, Um, and content if we are not doing that as individuals. And I say look at what has happened in the past, what God has pushed people to do in the past. The Old Testament scripture that Carol read is an excellent example of that, of Joseph pushing the, or not pushing, of Joseph telling the Pharaoh of God's plan and giving him wise counsel as to doing thus just this, of being generous, having foresight, and living in a way that benefits all people of putting a policy into place that allows them to actually be able to survive a famine and thrive as a collective, to be able to work towards a place where it is not their individual identity that brings them joy, it is not their possessions, it is not their power, it's not their authority. It's their ability to feed nations, to save thousands of people from starvation during this famine. A beaman allowed Egypt to be able to survive seven years of no food. John, is looking at the world and he is saying that the joy that you are seeking is not sustainable. The world that you are trying to live in is not one that brings the light of God into it. And then Joseph is saying this is the plan that God has set forth. This is the behaviors that we need to change in order to survive this, in order to be continuously be the people of God. Both John and Joseph express to the world what God's plan is. John talks about what Jesus is planning. Joseph talks about what God's planning. Both of them bring forward into the world a realization that there is a better and different way to find joy and satisfaction in the future and in our own lives. As we move forward into the world, the way that we perceive joy, the way that we perceive satisfaction and where we get it from can vary. I feel like I receive and perceive joy as differently from other people. Instead of being emotion that I just happen to feel at random times or something that I choose to do every day, it's something that's always present in the world. And the more that I focus on it, the more it will be apparent. So when I become busy and overwhelmed, I focus more on the tasks at hand. I focus more on, on what I need to do instead of on the little bits of joy that are ever present in my life. One of the reasons I was so excited to speak today is because I find so much joy in this congregation in this church. As we go forward, no matter how we perceive joy, no matter what reality we understand, no matter what our hearts are feeling, there is always a way for us to change our behaviors just a little bit, for us to fully express the joy of the Lord. 
and the way that Jesus came to this earth to express and the reasons that we are celebrating his life. It can be difficult. It can be incredibly difficult to find joy in the, in, the, in the world and to change our behaviors in a way that benefits others. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Jesus came for us. Jesus came to be the light of the world, and he gave his life so that we can be saved. Now, as we close in prayer, I hope that you all are able to see for yourselves the different ways that joy is in your life, joy is in the world around you, and be able to understand that you were loved. Now let's pray together. God, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for getting us to this place, for allowing us to all come together into this warm, beautiful sanctuary and be able to worship you. Lord, I pray that as we enter this week, that we are able to meditate on your words, that you open our hearts and be able to reveal to us the joy of your word. Be with us now and always, and continuously remind us of your love. Amen. Our tradition is not one that expresses joy that well, especially when it comes to this part. What would it look like for you to lift up a shout of joy in your own way? What would it look like for you even now to respond to what God has given you and to say, wow, this is something to be excited about? continue our time in worship as we sing this hymn of joy. Sing that chorus one more time. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Your love has come here to dwell. All thy works with joy surround.
Rejoice one more time. this benediction from Zephaniah 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I pray that all of you are able to experience the joy of the Lord this week and are able to feel his love, his satisfaction, and his quiet. Go now in peace. Amen. Ministry team meetings are downstairs. Thank you, Esther.